Good afternoon to one and all. A very grand welcome to Ra Online. So I am Dr. Virod Gopinath, and I'll be taking various sessions on pediatric surgery. So, in the beginning, what better topic to start off pediatric surgery than with one which is synonymous with pediatric surgery? So you find that one of the most important conditions associated with the pediatric population, which is surgically correctable is infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So it is also called idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So this man here is Hirschsprung. So Hirschsprung is basically, is, uh, pe pediatric surgery is equal to Hirschsprung. Pediatric surgery owes a lot to just not the surgeons as well, but to some physicians also. So as we have here, Dr. Hirschsprung was a physician a Danish physician based on Copenhagen, who was the first one to describe this condition called IHPS. He is associated with another disease as well, as we all commonly know, Hirschsprung's disease. So in his terminology, he, la he labeled IHPS as Angibordiner pyloris, pyloris stenose. So there are two other people who are closely associated with this condition. One is Dufour and Fredet who were responsible for the initial surgical con correction of this condition and of course the worldwide known Ramstead. So let us start off with the epidemiology. It is the most common cause for a non bilious vomiting in infants which is surgically correctable. With an incidence of 1.5 to 4 per thousand live births, it is said to be more common among boys. In fact, it is so common among boys that it is a rarity to see a girl child with IHPS. And generally, it is said to be associated with the first-born male child. That is how we usually describe IHPS as. Now, so what exactly causes IHPS or this hypertrophic pyloric stenosis as we know it? Like any other, most of the conditions in the field of medicine, there are no specific causative factors. When you have multiple factors, it means that none of them are actually contributing to the etiology of that particular conditions. So similarly, you have many genetic and environmental factors associated with this. So some of the environmental factors include erythromycin exposures, etc., which have not been proven at all. So because of its similarity to another very important condition called Hirschsprung's disease, it was initially postulated that possibly the absence of ganglion cells that we associate with Hirschsprung's disease could be the cause for this particular condition as well. But a prominent physician and scientist, Dr. Zulsa, he disproved this theory by stating that by showing and demonstrating that the number of ganglion cells and the maturity of the ganglion cells was the same in people who had IHPS and those children who did not have IHPS. So what are the other factors? So there are three important factors which are said to contribute to the to the etiology of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis or which predisposes to pyloric stenosis. The first one are a group of proteins called gastrointestinal peptides. So these gastrointestinal peptides include proteins like substance P, each epidermal growth factor, transforming growth factor alpha, somatostatin, insulin-like growth factor, etc. So substance P, as we all know, is responsible for the motility or the contracture of the entric, uh, entric muscle complex. So when you have excess amount of substance P, when it increases, it is said to be associated with an increased incidence of increased contractility of the pylorus and hence resulting in a stenotic condition that we usually see. Similarly, so transforming growth factor alpha is also said to be in, so noted in higher levels in those children, the pylorus of those children who have pyloric stenosis. Then, the second important proteins are a group of proteins called neurotrophins. So, neurotrophins, as the name indicates, are a group of proteins which help in the development and maturation of nerves. So, their absence is said to contribute, which is said to contribute to a reduced development of the nerve fibers, resulting in stenosis. So, some of the important neurotrophins act via receptors which are called as CKIT, which are basically tyrosine kinase A receptors. So, a decrease in levels of these receptors are noted in those children who are, sus who are suspected to have a hypertrophic or infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Similarly, another important protein is a glial derived growth factor. So, these glial derived growth factors also promote the growth of the nervous tissue or nerve nerves 
which supply the circular muscle fibers in the pylorus, resulting in uh, decreased levels of these proteins result in con increased uh, contracture of the nerve uh, mus circular muscles, subsequently resulting in pyloric stenosis. And also another theory which is now being proposed is that the interstitial cells of Kahal, as it's called, their levels seem to be less in those children who have infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. And this interstitial cells of Kahal are very important and they are, they, their activity is mediated by an enzyme called heme oxygenase 2. The levels of this heme oxygenase 2 is also been found to be reduced in the pylorus of those children who have infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. The third and the most commonly approved theory as far as the cause for uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is concerned is the reduced levels of nitric oxide. So, nitric oxide, for the production of nitric oxide, there are three important components, namely arginine, NADPH and O2, oxygen as it's called. So, these are converted into nitric oxide, NADH, NADP and citrulline. So, this conversion requires the presence of two important enzymes. One is nitric oxide synthase and the second one is nit NADPH diaphorase. So, NADPH diaphorase like nitric oxide synthase is an enzyme required to convert NADPH into NADP. So, the presence of both these enzymes, nitric oxide synthase and NADPH diaphorase is important for the formation of nitric oxide. So, deficiency of NADPH diaphorase or nitric oxide synthase is associated with reduced nitric oxide levels in the pylorus of children with pyloric stenosis resulting in reduced relaxation of the smooth muscles and subsequent hypertrophy of the circular smooth muscle fibers. So, as far as nitric oxide synthase is concerned, there are three important types of nitric oxide synthase. One is the nitric oxide synthase 1 or the neuronal nitric oxide synthase. Second is nitric oxide synthase 2 or inducible nitric oxide synthase. And third is nitric oxide synthase 3 or endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So, you find that Y and E our E is more common in the blood vessels and N is what we usually associate with the nerve fibers. So, what are the clinical features of a child with hypertrophic pyloric stenosis? The classical feature is a non-bilious vomiting which is projectile in nature and typically occurs 2 to 8 weeks after the delivery of the child. Now, there are two important points to note here. One is that it is non-bilious vomiting. It is never bilious vomiting because the pyloric secretions or the gastric secretions, obviously the bile does not reach the secretions and hence you have non-bilious vomiting. And the second thing to note is that it takes around 2 to 8 weeks for the projectile vomiting to start. So, that is a time taken for the circular smooth muscle fibers to become hypertrophied and for the child to develop vomiting. So, typically these children do not have vomiting at birth and projectile vomiting. So, projectile vomiting again depends upon the severity of the circular fiber, circular muscle fiber hypertrophy. So, they may not be present initially at the start of the vomiting, possibly by two weeks when it starts off, they may not have a projectile vomiting. But as the child develops more and more circular muscle hypertrophy, the child will start developing projectile vomiting. So, this is a picture of a child. This is a picture of a child with a classical projectile vomiting. 